Hello and good morning and welcome everyone to today's Inside webinar. My name is Jeff, I'm the director here. Uh, and uh, before we proceed, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we're gathered today and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that welcome to anyone uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background who might be in a room or joining us in webinar land today. Uh, particularly because this week is Reconciliation Week, so we need to acknowledge the impact of colonisation on our First Nations people including and how it impacts their rates of substance use and uh, acknowledge their resilience in that respect. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome James Howey to this webinar today. He's a team leader of the Queensland Health Drug and Alcohol Court Team, which is part of Metro South uh, Hospital Health Service, and he's here to talk about the newly launched Queensland Drug and Alcohol Court. So please join me in welcoming James. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone who's come into the room and Thank you for those who sat in the front row as well. That's always heartening. Uh, for those out there who are in webinar land, thank you for joining. I can let you know that it's a balmy about seven degrees here on the fourth floor of Bayala, as usual. So wherever you are, it's warmer, uh, which, uh, which um, it, it would be a nice place to be, but uh, that's all good. So look, thank you for the time um, that you're giving to uh, tuning in and coming along to this. And I guess, um, as you can see by the title there, we're talking about the Queensland Drug and Alcohol Court version 2.0. That probably has meaning at a number of levels. Uh, it's not me getting the presentation completely stuffed up that we had a version 1.0 of this, uh, and we quickly kind of remediated it. But um, probably eight years ago, I was actually here talking about drug court, not specifically about the program, but the introduction of an intensive outpatient option within the drug court program down in Bean Lee. So it is a little bit of an historical event to be back here again talking about drug court in 2018. And we are talking about the fact that this program has, as Jeff mentioned, relaunched, but it has been here before. So just out, out of interest, um, no one has to kind of answer this now, but, um, does anyone know when drug court operated here in Queensland? Um, how long ago it was? How many sites did it operate in across Queensland? Is anyone brave enough to pitch in a, a guess there? 2002, is very close. It started off in 2000, yeah probably wasn't really well known out there. <laughs> These things always take time. Yeah, it started in 2000 uh, and it ran to 2013. Here's a loaded question. Does anyone know why it stopped? <laughs> so, could talk about that for a while. <laughs> the great budget realignment of 2012 uh, is probably a nice way to put it. Uh, and in terms of locations, it previously operated in five. So how is it different this time is is, I guess, some of the uh, subject of what we're talking about today. But in reflecting on preparing for the session today, it kind of reminded me that I was with the last drug court, so I'm back in this one, so I guess there has to be some reason and interest and enthusiasm about what the initiative is. But it also started making me think about all those things in, um, I guess, in your life experience that there's, there's stuff in life you want to to have come back and there's stuff that you don't want to have come back. For me, something I never want to see again <laughs> is TAB, <laughs> if anyone remembers that, yeah. depending on the uh, your average age. Never ever want to see hypercolor t-shirts. <laughs> uh, sorry if I'm offending anyone here, but <laughs> this is just a bit of, I guess, self-disclosure. Mankinis, <laughs> never ever ever again. Uh, this is a bit of a, a double banger, this one. Not only mullets, but any song sung by Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> never want to see again. And probably my number one thing I never literally want to see again is the musical Cats. <laughs> so, I'm not, no offence here, it's not about Cats themselves, but the musical, if anyone's been to it, yeah, that's many, many hours of your life and I'm, uh, that you'll never get back again. Uh, so, 
what's on the flip side of that? Things I do want to see come back. I definitely want to see an intermission come back at the movies. I think that would be awesome. I believe there's some cinemas that do it, but I don't live in sort of trendy suburb areas. Bladder related? <laughs> yeah, it could be bladder. Yeah, age related, bit of bladder yeah. problem. <laughs> Just kind of masking it by wanting to race out and get my orange cordial. I want to see a tea trolley come back and real size Western wagon wheels. So, here, here. Okay, a few votes for the room in that. I'd love to see these things come back. Uh, as much as it is that I also am loving to see that we've got a drug and alcohol court come back in Queensland. And is it, uh, is it a sort of a version 2.0? Is, is it a repeat? Is it a reboot? It's a little bit more of a reboot, which hopefully is going to perform better than what was a really good version and a really good film in Pirates of the Caribbean 1. But then we unfortunately had loved on us Pirates of the Caribbean number 3 on Stranger Tides, which was, uh, sorry, at World's End, which was a load of rubbish. And for those of you around in 1970s, we were very, very much kind of enthralled and freaked out by Jaws, but then unfortunately we had the 3D version delivered on us about 10 years later. So hopefully the way that we're kind of actually going with this particular drug and alcohol court program is a, a second coming, a reboot, a revision that's uh, not going to fall into the basket here of some of these things that um, failed miserably. So we're back and we're up the road, literally. So round here, that's the Magistrates Court building. We're sitting on level four. I have a wonderful view of all the little things that go on, particularly the District and Supreme Court. It's really interesting what happens there and the little media scrums that form have a wonderful view of all of it throughout the day. But uh, we're up there and, and, and I guess a little bit about the program and how it came back. Um, and then we'll, because what I want to talk today is, yes, there's kind of the technical aspects and what's the referral pathways to this program, what's the eligibility, those things are important, but they're also captured in some of those handouts uh, and the information sheets, fact sheets, which are at the back of the room there. Uh, uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about what's kind of some of the, um, I guess, contextual and uh, theor theoretical underpinnings, or even kind of the social underpinnings of a drug and alcohol court, if it's going to be run well. And also then a little bit about, I guess, the client group, because to me that's the, the most important element, because we're working in this space, but uh, with the rate of referral of, from the criminal justice system here, I would not uh, be surprised if, uh, any, well, I would be surprised if anyone put their hand up here and said that they weren't working with people in this space somehow. It's one of our largest areas of referral. So obviously this was an election commitment. This time around, there was uh, quite a comprehensive review that was undertaken by experts in the field. Uh, Dr. Ari, sorry, um, eminent emeritus professor, Dr. Ari Freiberg from Monash University was one of the leads, and also Dr. Jason Payne from the Australian Institute of Criminology and the Australian Catholic University in Canberra, and other associated parties that were involved in looking at both national and international best practice. Out of that review came 20, uh, 39 recommendations. The first 10 kind of dealt with another space within the criminal justice continuum uh, of treatment, more that uh, diversion space, bail space, and all of that area is currently being worked on and around those recommendations. But the last 29 were about the fact that it was a Gucci and a good thing to reinstate a drug court or drug treatment court in Queensland. Uh, the review didn't set out with that as kind of the agenda. It set out to say, is it a good idea? And it came back saying that it was. But when, when we say that, um, I'll talk about service limitations a lot through this. A drug and alcohol court is not going to solve the crime and the alcohol drug problem here in Queensland, here in Brisbane, or anywhere that it operates. But it does occupy a niche on a continuum for a certain group of clients. And uh, so we then had the report handed to government in February last year and around June through the budget process there was an announcement of funding for a re-establishment of one, uh, one pilot site of a drug and alcohol court. So what is a drug court? Um, it's kind of not what it sounds like or is reflected there. But one bit that is correct there is that it's currently in Queensland sitting at the magistrate's court level. So if you know that we have, well, most kind of 
developed countries have a tiered court system. Um, magistrates court is, uh, uh, has normally a sentencing jurisdiction up to three years here in Queensland, deals with what is known as summary offences. I'm really starting to get out of my scope here a little bit, so um, I won't go too far with that, but summary offences uh, and uh, are those that um, uh, often involve, uh, well, I, I won't even go there, but they're not indictable offences, which if you get one of those, you're off to district and Supreme Court, sort of like mostly where a lot of the local councillors are going these days, <laughs> heading off to district with those types of uh, charges. So I guess it's useful to talk about some of the, um, they sound, they can, they can sound really wonderful if you just kind of look at the headline banners, but there's lots of thinking that needs to go on with establishing this type of program in a way that's actually going to be effective um, and potentially not do harm uh, because like anything there's often the iatrogenic effects of these types of things. First of all it's important to look at the conceptual language. Often what's used in this space are words like specialist courts, diversion courts. Technically a drug treatment court type program is, is really not so much those things. They're more uh, because they, a diversion court, drug courts don't actually divert people out of the, the justice system. They actually tend to hold on to them quite strongly. Um, it's kind of like being sentenced to having your life managed for two years by professionals, which is questionable <laughs> or, or challenging, for more challenging than sometimes it sounds. But they are more very much so problem oriented or solution focused courts is probably the language that best suits them because they actually start to not look at just the offences or the response to those offences, it's starting to look at what are the underlying issues or the environmental surrounding issues. Uh, specialist courts would fall more possibly into the area of like the domestic and family violence courts that set up in Queensland, where there's kind of a specialist response to a particular issue that's not necessarily about holding people in the justice system, it's more about processing them through in a way that's going to be informed about what the issues are. So a little bit of a nuance, but a slight difference there. The problem solving court movement comes out of the therapeutic jurisprudence approach, which pretty much in the 80s, uh, two chappies out of uh, uh, university in Arizona started to write papers and essays, um, Wexler and Winnick, uh, their names, that looked at the fact that um, the justice system itself, or the law more broadly, is a social force which can have therapeutic or counter or anti-therapeutic effects. And they really started to reframe the role of, uh, in their writings about what the justice system could do, but not only the justice system, but also the roles within the justice system. Therapeutic jurisprudence is a concept of how the law can be used, and in this case, more practically, the courts can be used to actually not only help people, but help communities and society by reducing uh, the harm that might be as a result of people's offending. They don't just look at the uh, people who are involved in the offending. Therapeutic jurisprudence in its widest sense looks at all the roles from magistrates to lawyers to victims and all of those sorts of things come into it. Um, other aspects about a well-crafted and potentially uh, established to set up a more effective outcome response for a drug and alcohol court is that it needs to look more at just more than just the alcohol and drug. That's one of the, um, I guess, uh, temptations of these sorts of programs is that it just all becomes about that the uh, AOD issues are the issues that are a direct causal relationship to the offending, that type of model. Research doesn't bear that out. Uh, the literature really kind of shows that uh, involvement in, in criminal or offending type behaviour, however you want to talk about that, I'm not a criminologist, actually tends to occur uh, earlier than the drug use for a lot of people coming through the system. So then you start to get that inverse causal relationship stuff that the criminal offending more association with drugs. And then there's other models that look at the vulnerabilities that people have and also common um, uh, etiologies as well of these types of things. So the direct causal model, if that's the only way to see this issue, you'll have a very limited uh, response and you won't necessarily address the issues that might be underpinning the substance use. 
other factors that need to be looked at to ensure that a drug court uh, type program or these types of problem solving courts don't do more harm than good. Uh, net widening, it's kind of like the equivalent in um, drug court language to kind of saying your mother wears army boots. It's naturally, it's a huge insult uh, in a way because it's one of the criticisms of drug court type programs is that they can grab uh, more people and actually bring them in and involve them in the criminal justice system than ordinarily they would be, or they could end up being set, uh, kind of set up for a much more onerous journey through the criminal justice system than, than if they had been through the normal processing. So there has to be protections around what our particular um, magistrate, who I'm learning a lot from in that space, around things like proportionality. That, you know, if, if someone was going to get a fine uh, for their drug offence, Drug, drug and alcohol court's not the place to come. Sentence escalation as well, which is that temptation sometimes for people to receive a harsher punishment just to get them in over the line of a particular program. So these things are very, very important in the actual consideration. Another one, and you know, we're dealing with a lot of this at the moment, I guess, from a Queensland health perspective, is the issues of privacy and consent, because drug courts by nature are a multi-team, multi-agency collaboration and there can be very different views about how information uh, and what information is shared. And it's really important that the actual process and the system set up to obtain genuine and proper consent for the sharing of information uh, because uh, privacy in these types of programs is something that needs to be kind of finely balanced. And the other thing that is in the drug court literature, but often needs to be uh, continuously, I guess, guarded and protected against. And I think we've got some really good uh, understanding of this in the new program that we've been setting up, is to make sure that the program never uses the instrument of treatment as a punishment. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, uh, as we go along, because the program obviously has uh, what I call consequences, or rewards and sanctions, rewards, incentives, uh, and, um, punishments, if you like, based on the behaviour modification literature. It's really important that treatment doesn't come into that because that has huge counter-therapeutic effects uh, for what people see treatment as. And that last one there is just often there's that perception that motivation is really, really important um, within the criminal justice system. Uh, but I think, again, we've got a lot of goodwill and understanding that that's actually, don't, don't target that to capture your cohort because it's a bit of a um, kind of a, it's not a really uh, significant thing that uh, predicts outcomes. Uh, so uh, in the early days of planning for this, there was a lot of talk about how do we assess, we assess people only who are motivated. Um, that's a bit tricky uh, uh, in any space, really. So to then underpin, I guess, the framework for a drug court, um, I think about, I'm not sure how, they went about this into probably in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when Queensland first went down this track, because there wasn't a lot of really kind of, there wasn't a critical mass of literature out there about these programs. They kind of popped up uh, in a version that was actually labelled a drug court in the late 80s on the eastern side of the US, and then they've kind of grown into a bit of a religion <laughs> over there now. They're huge. Um, there's about four or five thousand of them, but um, when we say that, they all occupy different spaces, bail spaces, post-sentence spaces, veterans courts, families courts, all those types of things. But there has been a lot of work done uh, by the National Association of Drug, Drug Court Professionals, which is a US-based organisation, but they tend to lead the world in this area, looking at what are the ten key com components. If you're going to construct a reasonably, relatively, uh, strongly foundationed drug and alcohol type court, the 10 things that are needed. I'll only really focus on those that relate to the treatment side of things, given the audience today, and, and I guess where my interest and kind of uh, experience is in, is that a drug and alcohol court has to kind of look at really integrating its systems with the treatment system. So it becomes treatment under ju judicial supervision. Uh, a drug and alcohol court, if it's actually going to uh, show from what's been uh, born out in the research to be effective is that it has to be a non-adversarial uh, type program. Uh, how that works in our court is that once somebody comes on to a drug and alcohol treatment order, there's a review team that meets uh, 
the moment it's meeting um, in the mornings before each court sitting day, which is only two days a week at the moment. Um, and that review team consists of the magistrate, a representative from police, legal aid, uh, corrective services and uh, Queensland Health. And there's other members as well, such as our cultural liaison officer who's attached to the court and other people as needed. So that's unusual to have that group kind of together discussing the progress of a participant and responses to uh, that progress during the course of things. So it becomes non-adversarial. Um, eligible participants, it's got to be kind of a fast process. The legal system can be a little bit um, involved um, and there's a bit of an involvement with us as well in terms of from where you first enter to where actually start, things start to happen. But trying to minimise those time frames uh, to grab people at, because when you think about the, um, the treatment literature on our side of things, those turning points um, in people's lives and often getting involved in the criminal justice system or things reaching a point of uh, kind of maybe decompensation that I've ended up um, in the criminal justice system can become really useful turning points that we don't want to kind of let, uh, I guess, um, expire for people at those points. Continuum of alcohol and drug services, I won't speak about this too much because we'll deal with it a little bit more in depth uh, in a few moments. Um, and that uh, there needs to be frequent alcohol and drug testing. That is one of the uh, things that you can never move away from in a drug and alcohol court program. It's one of, one of the only objective measures of progress that the, particularly the legal system needs to see. And, and, and it's understandable, given that uh, people in these types of programs and where it's set in Queensland, it's an option not to go to jail, but to participate and remain in the community. Um, okay, a couple of just the other ones. Uh, this is uh, quite a large one, which I won't spend too much time on because, uh, but there might be some questions around it, is that there needs to be a coordinated strategy around the behaviour modification regime of how the court works. So what that is, is behavioural consequences, either rewards or sanctions, based on progress around what is set as being short-term goals, long-term goals. Easiest example of that I can give is that one of the very short-term goals that's expected, well, that, that's encouraged and fostered within a program like this is honesty. It's not about being completely drug-free in the early days and months of the program, but being honest. So honesty will be rewarded um, in the early stages, quite, quite high, um, but then it becomes something that is expected and long-term honesty is something that should be a matter of course uh, for a person. Short-term, uh, a positive uh, drug test is not necessarily going to be sanctioned if it's accompanied by honesty. That's kind of how that works. There's a whole matrix around how this, this, this sorts of things work. Uh, remember, it is um, a, a still a criminal justice system response. Uh, but I, th uh, I would say that we are really doing well compared to other jurisdictions in Australia to how we, that policy has been crafted in such a way to recognise what should be a normal course of trajectory for somebody going through what is recovery from a, a substance use disorder that might be at the, that is at the severe end of the continuum? Um, I can answer any detailed questions around that as we go through, because it's not our usual space to work in as treatment professionals. We actually don't get involved as a Queensland Health team in uh, too much in making the the actual decisions, and that all rests with the magistrate anyway. We do input though, particularly if we feel that a particular uh, consequence is going to have, you know effects or not good effects or counter-therapeutic effects on a person. Um, a big thing in drug and alcohol court literature is the role of the, the power of the black robe, uh, to put it simply, that interaction with authority as represented through the magistrate. In a trauma-informed kind of uh, perspective, the court that we use is the Murray Court, um, normally the Murray Court up there, Court 32, Level 7 of the Brisbane Magistrates Court. It's quite a nice room in the way it's set up and it has the big large oval table for our, so our magistrate for reviews has made the decision to sit at that table rather than up at a bench. So those types of things. Initially they were going to give us the ceremonial court, court 17 on level 4. Don't, if you've ever been there it would have been a flash event because it's a very flash court. It's massive, it's cavernous. Um, we were asked our opinion and we just said 
yeah, it's probably a little bit intimidating. Um, so there was some really good work done by the magistrate and the courts team to look at rescheduling our courts into something that was a little bit more, I'll say homely, but it's, it is quite a, if you've ever been up to Murray Court room up there, it's, um, it's not like a normal courtroom, which is good. And that interaction where the magistrate, there's actually literature that boils it down to at least three minutes, no longer than eight, um, that you get good effects, better effects if it's between three and eight minutes in interaction. And one of the things that's different in these courts is that a participant does get to speak, speak direct, directly to the magistrate, whereas normally that's through your representative. So um, it allows for that time. Currently, because we only have participants in the first phase of the order, they're going to court every week for that chat and review with the magistrate. Um, I guess there's uh, one of the uh, things that could have been done in the last program, version 1.0 of the drug court here in Queensland, was that there wasn't really embedded. There were a number of external studies done, but there wasn't really sort of an, an embedded valuation strategy. Uh, that's something that is critical. And it's not just outcomes evaluations, it's process evaluations, as well as it's kind of like that regular review of what data you're getting to adjust programs um, on the run. And, uh, Lots of interdisciplinary education. I spend my probably every minute of every day doing this at the moment. Um, and there's again a lot of uh, good intention, goodwill, but that's not always therapeutic um, in the translation of things when you're dealing with the range of agencies that come together. Um, but also we have learnings as well in terms of a health team from, from other agencies. Learning lots of new words, um, learning to do uh, assessments through glass, um, a bit, which is, you know, again, things that aren't sort of normal in our, in our spaces, um, as well as the fact that a drug court can't survive on its own, even if it's well resourced within government, it needs to build connections into community because you're looking at sustainable outcomes, you're looking at reintegration uh, and all of those types of things. So those are kind of the core underpinnings to doing a good drug court and I think Queensland has adhered to these uh, in many ways. Um, Still room to get better, as there always is, and I'm very hopeful that there's some things that will get better um, and uh, that the ship will steer into <laughs> in, in a good direction. We were, Jeff and I were talking about that before. So some differences between the last drug court and now. We've mentioned a few of them. It was in five locations before, and that was Cairns, Townsville, Brisbane, uh, sorry, Beanley, Ipswich and Southport. Uh, North Queensland came on board a couple of years around about 2002. Um, but uh, the three in, in uh, South East Queensland here began in 2000. Uh, it's only one pilot location. That was a recommendation of the review to start small, to start in an area where you're going to get the client group um, because they're only a very small kind of cohort within the uh, ones coming through the criminal justice system as well as start in an area where you've got the community kind of resources and capacity to do a reasonable job. Uh, other things, last time it was illicit substances only, you've heard me refer it to a drug and alcohol court, this time it's the occlusion of alcohol. Interestingly, we've had around about the mid 40s of referrals since opening on the 29th of January. One has been primary alcohol um, and you know I have my theories around that. Um, 80, over 80% 80 have been methamphetamine. So whilst I don't buy into the myths of the epidemic and all of that sort of thing, but certainly uh, those types of stimulant substances uh, and crime um, do tend to kind of have a bit of a, a nexus there. So, but uh, the rest has then been, uh, so over 80% have been primary methamphetamine, but a lot of other use of other classes of drugs in that. But then we go to the opiate opioids and um, alcohol. There's been one presentation so far as a, as a primary. Um, we'll see how that goes, I guess, over time. Early days, only four months, so we'll see what happens. Um, we've got an evaluation framework embedded that's different this time. Last time, the, there was no really specific minimum. Technically, there was a nine-month minimum because you had to spend three months in each of the three phases of the drug court. But this time around, it's actually a minimum of a two-year order. So again, um, we're not wanting to pick up everybody onto this because to start getting two years, you know, there's some serious stuff kind of going on. This is not your first time offenders who's, who are facing um, the courts based on uh, fairly minor level charges. 
Okay, the other thing that's different this time that I think we're all going to have to start getting used to more and more in Queensland is that the court does have an option this time around to place a condition on an order for someone to wear a continuous alcohol monitoring device and the device that's been selected, there were different ones put forward during the planning process, the portable ones that you blow into, but it ended up being the ankle monitoring bracelet that measures transdermal alcohol content, um, sends a little message or it records that every 30 minutes or so and pushes the data through on a daily basis to a collection center. So it kind of is telling on you um, all day, every day in a way and uh, so those things may start to pop up and I guess I take this moment at, at this forum and, and, and having this I guess platform to just because uh, one of the things we've dealt with with this is and is that the, the culture in Queensland is these types of devices are usually associated with monitoring for sex offending uh, and that we have to be kind of aware that this is um, that that culture is out there culture is very difficult to shift but we're going to start seeing more of these not only from participants who are part of a drug and alcohol court type program but as of the end of March some of you may be aware that there was legislative changes in Queensland introduced that police and courts now and when people on bail can request people wearing you're aware of that Damien yeah uh, GPS monitoring devices which are not too dissimilar to that style um, of um, device so they are around. They won't be for everyone. We're currently finalising that alcohol use policy. It's gone from what was maybe a particularly unrealistic policy at one end, it's, and it's kind of been brought back to a little bit more sensible um, kind of uh, approach and language. And uh, we'll see how these go. But they are a new thing. And uh, currently at the moment, staff of the different agencies have the option of wearing one of these to trial it and test it out. Um, if anyone wants to put their hand up, um, as you can see, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't put mine up. So, <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, yeah, sure. Jeff, uh, questions just come here uh, about, is this just for people who have alcohol as a primary? Some of that is the discussion about where the policy position has been and where it's swinging around at the moment. Uh, generally, no. And in fact, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be, from what I understand, the operation of this is always a little bit different to the discussion and the planning. Uh, from talking with our magistrate in meetings, her view is that no one will actually come on an order with this uh, as part of a condition. It'll be something that will be uh, implemented over time as a response to maybe what is happening, where somebody might be really having difficulty with managing alcohol. So whether that's somebody who's got alcohol as a primary or whether there's been some cross-transference kind of going on, um, or an issue that, as we know in our work, often uh, the history of substance use is an unfolding story, and we don't have it all up front when we start working with people, but it might become an issue. Uh, but uh, from what I understand, and if anyone from that side of the uh, kind of wall is listening and I've got it wrong, please, please tell me when I get back. But uh, from what I understand, it won't be automatic. It won't be written into a treatment order from day one, um, unless, I mean, in a way, if a participant requests it, maybe that's uh, something that could be considered. Uh, so, yeah. But they are going to be around. We might see them more in our clinics uh, for different reasons because I think if the trial is considered successful, and I'm not quite sure what successful is, uh, because if you look at some of the research, yes, they have a great effect uh, reportedly in not and people sort of reducing or ceasing drinking, uh, but there's not a lot of longitudinal stuff once you take it off. And that's kind of still dealing with behaviour um, and the need for behaviour change. Okay. The program structure, so how it works is that there's a referral process. Uh, you'll read in, and some of this and a lot of what I'm about to whip through is in these um, diagrams and for those out there uh, at home or in their cosy warmer offices than here, uh, there's a link coming up soon where you can download some of the fact sheets. But referral, 
We should be aware of it in our sector. We should be aware of this as an option, particularly around the Brisbane area. However, we should never be getting too much involved in kind of uh, pushing a referral because it really should go, uh, we should, what we should be doing is getting people to talk to their legal reps or talking to legal aid or their private uh, solicitors about this because there's a lot of kind of things to consider. First of all, you know, is there enough evidence that you're going to be proven guilty in a court of law uh, before you start putting your hand up because one of the eligibility requirements is the intention to plead guilty. So should that be my course of option, we as clinicians or health professionals shouldn't probably get into those types of discussions. But being aware of it, being aware to get information to connect people, uh, my cards or cards for our team are at the back there as well, my details will be at the end of this, quite happy to have that conversation but we will always stop short of what is not our scope in terms of whether we would actually recommend that a person take that up, that's a conversation they need to have. And they will have many times because as soon as they come through the referral door, any magistrate's court in Queensland can refer someone to the Brisbane Magistrates uh, Drug and Alcohol Court. It's just that they're going to have to reside in the Brisbane area, uh, local government area, whilst participating, particularly in the first stage of the order. Uh, so uh, there is kind of that wide. Eligibility assessment different elements of that, that's about the level of offending, whether or not they were going to get a custodial, they've got to get imprisonment. Uh, while we've had the mid-40s of referrals, the ones that have not been uh, eligible have more been due to not likely to receive a term of imprisonment. So that end, or the other end, where indictable offences that can't be dealt with in a magistrate's court, that have to go up to a higher court. Those be they've been the main reasons why people have not come further along than the eligibility. Our role in that part of the process is just looking at the severity of the substance use disorder because um, uh, good or bad, probably more not so good, but there's hopefully change um, down the track. Currently the legislation states that there has to be a, um, a substance use that's been assessed using the, the DSM-5, um, which is not... Um, not always with the way that Queensland Health would have wanted these things at a severe level. So it's not sort of the uh, occasional uh, getting intoxicated in alcohol and doing something as far as a public use and offence down at the valley on a Friday night. That's not, not going to cross the line. And you wouldn't want to, to come onto a two year order and see us every week as a result of it. So then there's a suitability assessment, which is more from our side of things, the more biopsychosocial comprehensive assessment. Queensland Health has the role of recommending an initial treatment plan. Um, then there can be sentencing. So sentencing is actually on to what is now known as the drug and alcohol treatment order. In the last court, they were known as intensive drug rehabilitation orders. Um, and that is an order that prescribes a custodial part, which is wholly suspended. Uh, so there is actually a sentence, so this is a post-sentence disposition from the court system and uh, so that hangs over people while they participate on the program. And then there's a re rehabilitation part that sets out core conditions. Core conditions are what treatment uh, is uh, recommended as well as uh, down to the things like um, the requirements for urine testing, which in the first phase of the program is a minimum of three times a week, in including or, or uh, or randoms on top of that as well, uh, that they've got to come to court weekly. So now we're talking about the phase structure. So first three to six months, each phase is around that kind of length. Uh, Stabilisation during that phase, the focus is on reducing or ceasing the substance use. So we've got that, that language is in there. It's not all about being abstinent on day one. Don't have to clean yourself up to take a bath pretty much to come to drug and alcohol court. So urine testing is at three times a week. Uh, probation and parole uh, interviews weekly, treatment as to whatever that is, and we use a, a continuum of treatment. Phase two, which is the rehabilitation phase, so each of these is a graduated, it's a reward to go up to the next phase. Each phase is associated often with a change of treatment focus, a reduced number of conditions. So in phase two, it's, it's twice weekly urine testing, fortnightly court appearances, or as directed by the court. Phase three is more about uh, getting into education, family reunification, uh, employment if that's needed, ensuring that there's uh, independent accommodation. And um, then your testing's down to once a week, possibly uh, other randoms, your court's down to once a month. So it kind of all starts to back off 
and we then at Queensland Health do some aftercare once a person completes an order. Eligibility, that's kind of the criteria there. I don't need to probably go through those. Um, substance use disorder, Brisbane LGA, local government area, uh, those are the um, types of things that uh, anyone who's going to get a sentence over four years, that, that goes over the threshold of what drug court is. And this is where it falls more into that quasi, con quasi kind of um, treatment space rather than mandated treatment space. It's actually a consent based order, so a person has to agree to come onto it. It's um, not, uh, we don't have uh, civil commitment type dispositions here in Queensland that, that I'm aware of. That's a bit of a map of that area. So Morton Island, you're in. Uh, a bit tricky probably for those 10 o'clock calls in the morning for a urine test. Um, but uh, you haven't had anyone from Morton Island yet, but you're in if you know anyone. But pretty much the Brisbane local government boundaries. But there's a little bit of variation. I think it kind of goes out a little bit around those western suburbs there, sort of Inala. I think some of that might be Ipswich, but comes into to the Brisbane court jurisdictions area. And in terms of offences, what the only really absolute kind of no-go area is sexual-based offending under the uh, criminal code. That's excluded. Uh, violence can be included with qualifications. So there's certain risks that have to be weighed up by the team and particularly the magistrate around if there's risk to community, any individual and community, domestic and family violence type uh, considerations and all of, uh, all of those types of things. Mental health, certainly not an exclusion. There's bits of myths that both of those things are out. Uh, and this court, this time around, can take some charges that are related to supply, because supply doesn't take much to get to cop a supply charge, um, and uh, also producing, not trafficking, trafficking's out, um, that all tends to go up to those high court, higher courts anyway, but certain uh, ranges within producing, because both of those can be linked to somebody who's got a lifestyle or a or a um, condition that is kind of highly involved in those activities as a result of uh, a co-occurring substance use issue. There's the uh, link to the actual website, or the court's website, their material published. There's an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander fact sheet, and there's also a uh, general fact sheet as well. Both of those are also available for those here in the room today at the back. But if you're wanting to go and uh, source those just to hand out, and we can do that. I think that's an important part of our role to know about these sorts of things, particularly for those who are obviously operating within the pilot site down here or in, in services around that area. Uh, but uh, getting too involved in, um, um, you know, you couldn't, for example, you couldn't ring us and we couldn't take the referral. It's actually got to go through the court. The only per people who can technically refer are magistrates. Um, and then that's through a conversation that clients had at that first appearance or their arrest court or wherever it is that they're appearing. That's the, uh, the nature of the players involved. Uh, we currently sit, uh, all of us except for Legal Aid Queensland, uh, we all sit as in a co-located office up on the fourth floor of the Brisbane Magistrates Court up the road here. Um, I say it's co-located, it's not integrated. That's a little slogan that I'm using a lot at the moment because uh, just in helping, I guess, everyone bind their feet in terms of what our roles are, what our boundaries are, what our scope is, and that uh, actually this was described by somebody up at the Mental Health Alcohol and Other Drugs branch today in a meeting with a number of players going, it's not like a cake, it's like a batch of scones. So that's um, one way of looking at it. Um, in terms of what Queensland Health does, all of those things I mentioned as well as we're involved because we've got a team of six people, five clinicians and one AO, who have been resourced as part of this program. So we provide both direct treatment and also we do linkage and referral to uh, care coordinate around other issues such as physical health, mental health, um, and uh, we have got had discussions and arrangements with different services both within Queensland Health and external to us around linkages uh, to uh, have referral pathways there as well. Out of the review, these were the things that popped up about what treatment should look like out of the, re the big review 
that was done on national and international best practice around providing AOD treatment within a criminal justice space. Um, and uh, that is what we built our model on. Uh, no, no surprises there, I guess, for anyone. The residential when clinically indicated, that's been a, a shift in Queensland. The last drug court really probably uh, saw that. That was kind of like the, the default option. And uh, but that's been changed a little bit because we just don't have access to that. There's no funding for treatment services under this, this particular drug and alcohol court. Uh, so uh, it's all working kind of under existing agreements with services to try and get some placements as well as we've based on more contemporary research, we've set up a more uh, intensive uh, community-based option for people as well. That, without going into too much detail, because um, I don't want to get too boring, is a part of the 34-page document, which is our health model of service. And uh, I guess it's incorporating all that we do within the space of the Drug and Alcohol Court, which is assessment, we do a day program, uh, we also do individual counselling, we do linkage and referral for uh, medicated uh, assisted treatment, uh, sorry, medication assisted treatment, which is not an issue here in Queensland, but na internationally there's lots of jurisdictions where this is a huge issue and all, it's, it's banned in some areas, uh, which is just crazy, crazy stuff and crazy talk, but it does happen, but there's no issues with that in uh, Queensland, um, which is good. We uh, uh, have a great arrangement uh, with the wonderful people at Family Drug Support to, uh, we haven't actually commenced it yet, but we will be doing some family information support and warm referral to their service as more, a more holistic kind of approach, working with the, the, the system of the client and uh, other types of services as you can see there. Just moving along fairly quickly, in terms of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space, we're running at about very solid 30% of that of our referrals are from people who are identifying uh, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander with women, which was another area that this drug court wanted to target. We're sort of between about 50 and 20%. It only takes one or two women to either make that go up or go down at the moment because they're of that kind of lower number. So, but we're, uh, that's a key performance indicator that we're looking at, and so far it's tracking on what reflects in the criminal justice population. Um, we have a cultural liaison officer who uh, we work very closely with. They're employed by the courts, they're not clinical, but a huge, hugely powerful and wonderful resource um, and uh, do work with our clients and do work with us in terms of our case planning and case consultancy. Um, I'll just skip over a few things here. Do they work? Um, like I said at the beginning, drug courts are not gonna solve the problems of the world. Uh, they can sometimes be touted as that. If you ever go to a National Association of Drug Court Professionals Conference in the US, which I've done, and there's like five to 7,000 people there, you can feel like the world's gonna change um, in a very evangelistic type way. But all the best research is showing that the mean effect on the re reducing criminal or, or offending behavior against traditional criminal uh, offending interventions is between eight to 13%. That's how much it's kind of works, uh, which is, doesn't sound a lot. Cost-wise, uh, harm-wise to community, it is a fair amount. And particularly when you look at the fact that you're working with that kind of high-risk, high-need group as well, who are very criminally involved, very substance use involved by the time that they end up in a drug and alcohol court. Uh, why do they work? The literature kind of have, bores out three areas. Uh, to just boil it down to simple things, that they potentially have a good drug and alcohol court is set up with all those other, looking at all those other factors, not just the drug and alcohol, but looking at housing, looking at education, looking at family, then there will be a reduced need to reoffend at the end, uh, if all that has kind of been looked at. That there's accessibility to interventions, that there's actually a menu of services, a continuum, easy access, and that there's leverage that you'll get people who otherwise would not enter treatment, who would actually do this because of the potential adverse effects, voluntarily though, to not go to jail, um, but to come into a treatment option. Which is why I enjoy working in this space, because you get to work with people who don't necessarily would walk, wouldn't walk through your door at other times. Um, I'm there for the client, it's not there for all the other stuff, because at the moment the program, it's finding its feet, it's very focused on the court stuff, very focused on the client stuff, 
uh, sorry, on the um, compliance side of things, uh, the stuff about the clients is starting to work its way through now that we've got some clients who are on the order and they're not doing all the tick boxes. <laughs> doing all the little things that, that, that they do so it's starting to kind of focus and shift in that direction which is good um, and working in this space and I just want to acknowledge and I'm sorry that I talk a lot uh, that we're running out of time is um, I really do want to kind of promote I know this is a difficult client group to work with and if, if I asked people to kind of come up with their their thoughts around what the characteristics of this client group were and then if I said to you today you're going to see four of these clients in a row um, it might elicit certain feelings and emotions for a lot of people in uh, what is sometimes a difficult space to work but I suppose I just want to turn your mind to I won't go through all of this sort of thing but just so that we maybe give this client group a second look if, if we are struggling in that space we're doing, um, as part of the trauma-informed care approach, we are screening not for trauma at assessment because it's too, they don't, people don't trust you, they've been abused by the system and also the symptomology of trauma and protractable early withdrawal or protracted withdrawal, it's all too confounded. So we are looking at self-report on experience of adverse life events using the life events checklist. That measures 16 different types of things that can be potentially adverse and it asks for endorsements around, yes, it's happened to me, or yes, I've witnessed it, or I've heard about it, those types of things. What's coming out um, is that data that we're seeing 100% of our participants who are endorsing that they have, and this is just what they've experienced, I'm not asking what they've witnessed, that's, that's another graph and would go on too long. 100% physical assault, two thirds, 66% roughly, sexual assault, unwanted sexual experience for another third, captivity, a third. This doesn't happen in the normal population um, at all. These are really kind of quite uh, significant things. Whether this is then going on to a trauma-related condition, that's a whole nother piece of assessment. We use this information to ask so that we open that door so that later on as we build trust, we can revisit this and kind of go, is this now time to kind of talk about this further? Um, but I just wanted to, I guess, uh, have the opportunity this morning to turn to mind to what we might often see as an unmotivated or treatment resisted group, that there's a lot potentially that's going on behind that um, for people. And that um, all those wonderful skills that we all say that we have around motivational enhancement orientations and motivational interviewing, that's not just your decisional balance stuff, that's actually having a philosophy and approach which will hold the broccoli, the, the stuff that we don't kind of want to hear, um, and as well as is used to actually help people motivate about treatment. Often our first questions if we're being a motivational act practitioner is to talk about what people think about the drugs itself. Let's, let's go back a little bit and actually name the stuff around how do you feel about being here and, and being in treatment. It, it, it's, a, it's a really good way to start to build genuine rapport. It's been my approach, um, this is just my tip, I'm not giving you any research around that, to actually name those issues about the fact that people may feel forced, coerced or otherwise, how they feel about that and being able to hold that when it is that we maybe get the stuff that's, uh, you know, could be interpreted as resistant, but not to assume then, because a true motivational interviewing approach actually doesn't assume that there's only one side of the coin, which is often what the person is showing us up front, which is the pushback or the defensive positioning. It assumes that there is stuff on the other side and let's just spend a bit of time building a relationship that might end up taking us there and searching that out over time. But we don't have time to do all of that sort of thing because uh, I could talk forever. So I am hopeful that this court will end up in a full-size wagon wheel, um, <laughs> that uh, it will have all the bits and pieces fall into place. That's our details. And just to assure you that I'm not anti-cats, Thank you very much for having us. I do. Cats are cool. So. Thank you. 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 Thank um, so operating to 2021, and our cap is, is nominally 125 participants. So no, we're not near the cap yet. 
and we don't actually have 45 that's how many referrals we've had um, but uh, yeah so we're building we're building that particular monitor here is that for alcohol only or does it also include other drugs at the moment it's alcohol only but uh, expect in the next probably five to ten years there's lots of biometric biomonitoring devices that are being developed so I can and, and the criminal justice space loves these things so I can see that there will be more uh, but at the moment, in it's alcohol only. Yeah. Hi, it's Nick Hall of Yenovitz. Uh, I'm just wondering why it's a pilot project. Was, wasn't there any outcome measures from the previous uh, drug court experience uh, where we, we now have to pilot into whether it works or not? Or it's just basically a limited budgetary measure? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Uh, you're, speaking, you're touching on very, very <laughs> soft spots there. Basically, yes, there were there were there were studies done. Um, Australian Institute of Criminology ran three studies on the previous drug and alcohol court. One about the North Queensland one, one about the early days of the South Queensland, and then a, a, a recidivism study that was done in 2008 that looked at the first 100 graduates and then tracked them for two years afterwards to see what would happen. Uh, that did show that, yeah. Uh, um, uh, the, the health and welfare stuff was never really picked up in Queensland. The data was never collected very well, so we don't have anything on that. But we did see, for example, that people who came on to, an, uh, in the last drug court, came on to an order who uh, didn't complete it, they, what was called, terminated the order, not the person, um, that they were, with it, the 77% of them offended within that two year range post uh, terminating the order or exiting the order, as opposed to people who graduated the order, it was down to 59%. The severity of offending was less, and the number of days before the survival analysis of the number of days before first offence was much longer for the people who had completed the program. So, yes, we had all that kind of recidivism data because that's really what politicians want is, is it helping the community side of things. But to do it again, um, it's probably a good thing that they did a fairly extensive review and a consultation with over 168 people to, because uh, there were things that could have been improved from the last drug court. Uh, but um, I think you'll find it's a pilot site, mainly to obviously see that it works, but probably also budget, I, I would say. Because uh, not all agencies were funded. Um, the only agencies that were funded under this pilot were courts, legal aid and corrective services, uh, police, health and housing, who are on board but had to re internally reallocate funding to get this up and running. So I don't know if I've answered that question, but I, I, I think I agree with the sentiment of what your conclusion is. <laughs> yeah. Hi James, I just had a couple of questions. Um, historically, I believe drug court may have had beds reserved within residential yep. treatment facilities. Has yep. that rolled out with this funding as well? Sure. Um, and uh, uh, acknowledgement to uh, non-government organisations out there who I've been pestering for the last 12 months. Thank you for all the wonderful uh, morning teas and coffees that I've had in your presence who are listening in at the moment. Uh, basically, previously there was specific funding that reserved specific numbers of placements um, that were for drug court participants. This time around, there's not that option. Uh, what we are using though is that currently the Department of Health does have an allocation of funding to some of the major residential services that we would all know across Southeast Queensland that's called court referral services. So that's available for things like Q-Merit, it's available for CourtLink, which are those bail based programs, it's available for Queensland Integrated Court Referral. Uh, and by the way, anyone listening from Cairns, CourtLink's due to roll out there on the 25th of June. Um, but basically what we've got is a really, they've been very, very great and generous and willing to reallocate or tweak some of that funding to take priority referrals from us. But there will not be the same level of utilisation of residential in this program as there was in the last one. It will be a limited number of beds and a limited number of services uh, for, for, this, for the duration at the moment of the current contracts and I don't know what will happen after that. Yeah. Um, I had a second question and it was about, oh, in the presentation you mentioned, because um, we're from a statewide service, you mentioned something about the um, allocation being within Brisbane, residing within Brisbane. Do they Correct. have to have a permanent address within Brisbane or can we move them into the area to participate in the program? Um, or is that being sneaky? We do that a lot. Yeah. Uh, any health bureaucrats in the room who are... 
who are hearing the words around importing problems into the <laughs> into the area. Um, not look, basically, I'll answer that by just saying if they have an address that checks out in Brisbane, they can be uh, referred to the, the Drug and Alcohol Court. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I've got a few online which some have been answered. So to those participants who are sorry, we're going long. If anyone needs to leave, please um, do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you, thank you very some much. examples of rewards and sanctions in the coordinated strategy. Oh yeah. Um, if anybody who's asked that question wants a detailed list, I can email it to you. It's not a problem. Um, at the low end, it begins with things like verbal praise yep. from the magistrate, uh, applause, clapping. That's a common one in drug and alcohol court. Reduced number of uh, reporting, so maybe a reduction in urine testing, or getting granted uh, an exemption from urine testing. So say, if I want to go away for a weekend for a family reunion in Rockhampton, uh, and I've been going well, I can apply for that, and then I can be granted that I'm not going to be called up for a urine test. Um, other rewards can be phase graduation, so graduate, graduating up through the phases. Uh, reduction in community service is another type of reward. Uh, we're not using monetary based rewards or the fish bowl, which is a bit of a drug court thing. I'm happy to explain that to anybody offline who wants to know about that. Uh, sanctions can be verbal, the opposite of verbal praise. What's that kind of like? A bit of a caution, a bit of a verbal caution. Uh, you can't really declap someone, so that doesn't come into it. It could be, though, um, a, ref a reflective essay. Um, yeah. Lines. Lines. <laughs> well, not quite lines, not quite lines. Um, there's actually a whole series of topics that's an addendum to the policy of what could be chosen. So, uh, writing um, uh, a reflection. More testing, never more treatment though. Never like, you've got to do two counselling sessions this week or anything like that. That could be a therapeutic adjustment, but that's not a sanction. It could be that someone does need to step up, um, because we run a step up, step down continuum. Um, Punishment can also go to community service. It can also go to days of imprisonment, up to seven days. So that's kind of the high end, though. The highest end of a sanction of a of a negative consequence is uh, revoking of the order and therefore returning to custody. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what kind of support is given in the aftercare phase? Yep. yep. Um, well, what it looks like on paper, because we're a long way off um, delivering it is at the moment it's three months of ongoing contact um, through Queensland Health that is um, available if we haven't already, if a person's not linked into somewhere else, as well as at any point post the drug court order, the ability to re-engage with us for a short-term intervention for either addressing that issue or for linkage to other services. So that's what uh, we're offering because we believe we feel that we will have a relationship at that point, so we're not going to kind of go, don't come back to us, if that's the easiest place when things are starting to go a bit wobbly. Yeah. Will Queensland Health staff be required to report any breaches of orders? Uh, good question, good question. Uh, and the uh, simple answer to that is yes. Uh, if it's a, if it's an adherence or non-adherence to a treatment order condition, however, how you, that, that's all up front. But how, we do, how you do that is the um, important thing, which is about doing that with the client. And that's how we intend to work, which is those conversations with a client, assisting them to take responsibility and working with that. So it's not a, um, a straight line um, to, to doing that. Uh, there's a, a lot of conversations that we have in, in um, supporting people, and that's working well. Um, it's uh, where you have to have very kind of mature and um, you know, kind of clinicians to, to, to do that sort of work. Yeah. And um, some of that privacy confidentiality I mentioned before. Yeah. And I know you mentioned it's a four year trial, but are there plans to extend it to other regional areas? I'd say no at this stage, um, because I think it'll be the outcome of the pilot that will determine that. Uh, and um, I, I'm not aware of any plans, no. And somebody wasn't sure what the fishbowl. Uh, oh yeah. What's that? Fishbowl is if uh, if the and this ha happens in a lot of US courts. So if you've got a if you've got a consequence that's positive, you've done really well this week. You can go over and dip your hand in, and pull out an envelope that might say that you've won a toothbrush, um, or uh, games uh, tickets to the footy, but 
this uh, Melbourne Drug Court was running one of those, but then there was the big inevitable media cry about the fact that tickets that have been donated to things like the football, they're all donated, um, that people who should have been in jail were out enjoying the football. So they've, they've had to take it back down to things like cakes of soap and toothbrushes. Uh, but it's that concept of you've been rewarded, that public display of your being able to pull something out. So it's like a token economy, contingency um, kind of reinforcement or uh, that type of uh, approach. Uh, but we're not doing that in Queensland. Um, so, yeah, they seem to, whenever media pick up on these things, they get skewed yeah. in a way. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you. You've all been very patient. Thank you for staying. <laughs>